Atheist Nomads, episode 123, The Satanic Temple of Seattle, with Case. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hey, you know what? We might just have to add satanic people to that list. <laughs> yeah, we might here pretty soon. Because uh, joining us today is Case from the Satanic Temple of Seattle. He serves on their executive board, was heavily involved in leading their work with the Bremerton uh, football game prayers, and also helped set up their their uh, street campaign uh, challenging the Jehovah's Witnesses. Case, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thank you both. Thank you both for having me uh, on the podcast. So in that, in that intro, it says uh, this will be cursing and hoo-hahs. And so I feel like I've... I've got to make sure that I inject those into this interview at some point. So like, okay, there's the bar. I got to make sure we, uh, we meet that bar. Yeah. Or, or at least That's get close definitely. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Accepted. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I had lots of fun working with you on the Joe Kennedy thing. So we're going to have to talk about that. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate the help that you had, uh, help had, uh, be our man on the ground for that. Yeah. We'll get around to that. Well, why don't we just actually start there? Okay. So, uh, so basically what, uh, I had joined, uh, the satanic temple. Oh, actually, you know, I should preface this with the fact that I am not a representative of the satanic temple in an official national capacity. Um, so that a lot of things we'll talk about will be my own reflections and my own thoughts about the group. So, uh, yeah, yeah we're, we're under a fair amount of scrutiny. So we just want to make sure that, you know, I get that disclaimer out there that this is really my reflections about the whole thing. So, um, basically I joined them, uh, in roughly April of this year, Lilith had given a talk for the organization that uh, uh, I have a science organization here and um, science based and she gave a talk for us and when I realized what they were about I was just uh, I immediately knew that this was something I had to get involved in and and for those of your listeners who don't know uh, roughly what they're about is that uh, they challenged the idea of religious liberty and um, uh, that that if a certain religion wants preference in the public sphere, then they have to give preference to all the other religions. And I, I know we'll touch on we'll touch base on that uh, throughout this. And so when I realized that it wasn't about devil worship and it wasn't about all these these things you typically associate with Satanism, you know, the whole Levian thing and might makes right. When I realized that it was it was something else, I knew that we had to she and I had to work together. So um, so I met with them, and over the course of a few weeks, I realized they really were what they said they were. There was no trap door, nothing uh, you know, really strange about the group that you know, would be uncovered over time. Um, I got to know folks, and I said, okay, here's, here's something we need to do, is that um, uh, with regards to the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, they, they maintain a, pretty much a semi-permanent presence at um, uh, the downtown Seattle metro uh, bus stations. They, they actually, yeah, you know, they set up. I'm sure you guys have seen it. The cart. There's two people. They, they, they wait for people to go by and try to engage them and, and get them to to know Jehovah. And it, wow. it's that, yeah. And and that's you know from for uh, that's a violation of the separation of church and state. I mean, how can Metro allow these people to be? Uh, on public property from, and say in the case of the International District in downtown Seattle, they're there from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through yeah, Saturday. Yeah. Monday Fucking through Saturday. Fine. Yeah, yeah, Monday through Saturday. And, and obviously they have, rotated, they have rotating volunteers, but there's always a, per, a semi-permanent presence there. And that, that for me, and I think for a lot of other people, that gives the impression that Metro endorses this, you know. And I, I'm sure you folks have spoke about Jehovah's Witnesses before. I mean, they are a cult. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, in fact, I have a, a lot of sympathy for people who are in Jehovah's Witnesses because, uh, especially if they were born into it, they they really don't. They see the whole rest of the world as the secular enemy or satan or, or evil, and you know, there's a larger war between them. And you know, I'm sure you guys know the the whole um, way cults kind of control those who are within it. So um, anyway, back to Jehovah's Witnesses. So over time, uh, I found out that uh, we looked into the regulations for um, the bus stations, and it turns out that this is not 
a legal thing for them to do. They cannot erect anything uh, on the property. They can only stand in certain spots. So we decided, well, why don't we do a street action? Why don't we just, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have become so ingrained in what we, you know, what we see in downtown Seattle. How about if we had Satanists come down and, and do case. the same thing? Yeah. Case. Were, uh, were they actually like putting up displays and such when they were there or just yeah, standing they, around? Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, I, they have a cart. Uh, uh, it's a, um, a brochure cart that they can, they can you know, roll into position and then erect it into place. Uh, in fact, at the, um, the downtown Bellevue Transit Center, they actually have chairs and a card table set up. So, right. so yeah, yeah, I mean, they're comfortable. They're, they're mm. in position. <laughs> and I've actually, I have pictures of it where, it, you know, for, in order for you to cross the uh, Bellevue Transit Center island to get to the other side of it, you have to pa- pass a phalanx of Jehovah's Witnesses to get there. And it, so it actually blocks your, your, your way across the sidewalk. And, you know, people just turn a bl- blind eye to it and just, it, that bothers me. And I remember engaging the guy, I remember talking to him about it. And Jehovah's Witnesses, they have a script, you know, they have a script that, you, you know, like Scientology, you, you come to them, you know, asking questions. Usually you're, you're at a low point in your life and you're just kind of looking for answers about something. So they have a script to follow. And, and I, I, I'm aware of the script. So you just break the script. You say, well, you know, um, do you do you have rights to be here on on public property? I mean, your church doesn't doesn't uh, pay taxes. You folks don't vote. You don't participate in the military. You won't do jury duty, and and all the ways that people contribute to a society. Your religion does none of those. So what gives you the right to use public property to prosthetize your religion? In fact, in fact, my favorite quote of this is, "What does Jehovah need with a transit center?" You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you know why? You know why do you need why do you need a transit center to make this happen? And, and that completely breaks the script. All the guy wants to do is somehow refer me to scripture, and uh, um, and I that, say that is yeah. that that is really odd though. I, I'm sorry to to pull it back for a second, but I didn't know that they wouldn't serve on a jury. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, I, I, that part I could be wrong. I could be wrong about that, but the rest of it for sure. They will it, at least try to get out of jury duty. Yeah. They, uh, they view themselves as not being citizens of uh, this country. Yeah. Lovely. So, yeah. So okay. they, want, they want all the things that, you know, the society protect, you know, um, that we enjoy as a society. Uh, you know, if they go on, if they get laid off, they will definitely collect an unemployment check. If their homes got destroyed in a disaster, they will definitely collect money from the government just like everybody else would. But they will contribute nothing, you know, to society. Obviously, they pay taxes as individuals. But, um, um, uh, you know, they 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 have a, a very anti-government worldview. Yeah. So anyway, so so for them to use the to their, for them to use uh, the First Amendment in order to you know or they also they say to to prosthetize on public property, well I I, I just I uh, I take issue with that I take issue with that. So um, so I told them I, I, this was before I joined. I said, what are you guys going to do? What if what if the Satanists come down here and try to set up the same thing? And that was that little. See that was playing in my head, like, what if the Satanists came down here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so we decided, you know, uh, several months later, you know, like after I joined the organization, I got to know people. We decided we're going to set up our own street campaign. And, you know, uh, we set up in downtown Seattle at uh, the Westlake Tunnel entrance. I took pictures of the Jehovah's Witnesses who are there, and they actually stand underneath the no loitering sign. And ah. You know, I mean, oh, there's, wow. just, there's no enforcement of it. There's absolutely no enforcement of uh, I, if, if it was a bunch of teenagers loitering outside that entrance. Of course, the cops would shoo them along. Metro, Metro police would, you know, get them moving. But as Jehovah's Witnesses, somehow they, they had this diplomatic immunity, so to speak, where they, you know, they they're overlooked. They're completely overlooked. So we what decided to move. That is just ew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so anyway, we decided to set up the same thing. So we got a giant banner, a uh, giant satanic temple banner. We got brochures of our own, uh, our rules of engagement that we weren't going to bother the Jehovah's Witnesses at all. We we're going to be our own thing right next to them. And the reactions we got from people were just fantastic. They were fit. You know, like when you, if you, if you, you know, set up as a uh, Satanist, uh, you know, in front of people, you, you, you really do wonder what the range of reactions is going to be. Are people going to be violent? Are, we gonna, are they going to get in our faces? And for the most part, the, the reactions were they look at us, they, you know, like at first they read the signs, which are very, very pro uh, individuality in terms of this is my body, I do my choice, that sort of stuff. So as they walk by, they see the signs like, hey, I can agree with that. And oh, I can agree with that too. And then they get to the Satanic Temple banner. 
And you just <laughs> see their faces like like sour lemons, like, oh, I just agreed with Satanists. I can't believe it. But my favorite reactions were from, from people who are tourists who are clearly from out of town and just these looks they got as um, – as they walked by us. One of, one of the members, he actually came up with us some very funny saying that he would say now and then. He, he said, uh, have you heard the bad news? And boy, was that a funny thing to say. That, uh, um, that got us some funny looks. So, so anyway, <laughs> on that day, on that day, we, um, uh, that's when uh, I saw the paper. I happened to be going into Walmart to just get some things. And I saw the paper about the Bremerton, the coach who refused to not pray. And that was, that was just like revelation. Like, you know, we've got to do this. We've got to get down there. We've got to make sure that we, you know, we let them know that, you know, if, if he continues to pray, we want to give an invocation right there too. So um, uh, after the street action for, for the Jehovah's Witnesses were over, we put together a, um, a press release that, uh, and, and in, in, in doing this, it wasn't just for the local media. We actually sent copies of this to this press release to the Bremerton school officials uh, because we wanted them to know that we were coming. Um, so uh, for, for me, it was very important that we have a student invite us because mm -hmm. for, in order for us to just show up, it just it didn't have the same weight as a student saying, you know, my beliefs aren't being represented. I want I want someone, you know, a Satanist to come down. And I remember as we were batting around the idea of putting it all together. Someone yeah. suggested that, well, you know, no student is going to want you to come down, you know, this. And I said, I said, in every school, in every high school, there's that one kid. There's that one kid, you know, <laughs> who's either into death metal or, you know, is rebelling against the system. I guarantee you one kid is going to do this. So uh, we um, wanted to make sure students knew what we were doing. So we put together a flyer. And that's when I, I contacted um, uh, someone in the Kitsap area. And they referred me to Wesley. I'm like, oh, yeah, Wesley, he and I go way back. And as, as you know, Wesley, I contacted you and, and you were just so psyched about this. You were just so psyched about this. And you couldn't wait to get the flyers, couldn't wait to paper the school and let them know. And, you know, maybe, maybe I could just toss to you and, you know, you tell me how things were on your end in terms of, you know, printing up the flyers and what you did. And, you know. Well, well I, I can definitely tell you that I didn't sit out in the student parking lot on my scooter in the rain passing out flyers. I okay. definitely <laughs> did, did <laughs> not do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, before work, yeah, just and uh, the 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 student that that did talk to that did get in contact with you is a really really nice person, not 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 the average like the death metal person that I would have, you know, you were thinking might might contact you, but yeah, it was I mean, everything was on the up and up. Everything was very nice, very well-mannered and everybody was just, you know, wanted wanted to do the right thing. Yeah, yeah. It was important for me that we put actual flyers at the school because I wanted I wanted the Bremerton school officials to know that we were real, that we were real. We you know, we we could come down there and we you know, we have no problems with that. And you know, obviously if you're passing out a flyer or putting a flyer under people's windshields that's got a giant pentagram with a goat on it, that gets people's <laughs> attention, you know. Like in fact, you know, if I could throw back to before this and that is um you know, I've done a lot of work with the secular community for, gosh, uh, about eight or nine years now. And as you guys know, I mean, we have that kind of that unofficial mascot of the flying spaghetti monster. And, yeah. and, it's, and for Cute. years, that's, it's adorable. And for years, that had, that had been fine for us. But it, it, it really had hit its ceiling in terms of effect on, on uh, the dialogue that you can have with Christians. It just – it was really an inside joke for atheists. Um, and so if, if you try to explain to Christians what it's all about, it just does, it has no traction. It has no well, traction. One good example would be when I was, yeah, I'd just, uh, I'd moved to Tacoma. I started work uh, there. I was fresh out of the seminary. I was considering myself a deist at the time and uh, talking to a coworker. Um, she told me she was Pastafarian. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that meant she was an atheist. I thought it meant she was insane. <laughs> I would have I would have thought she meant Rastafarian. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew that wasn't what she said. I even asked her to repeat it a few times. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. she started talking about the flying spaghetti monster. And I was like, this is just weird. Yeah. But of course that was back in two thousand seven, so <laughs> yeah. things have changed since then. The, yeah, yeah. So so anyway, so I, I, I understood the you know, in using the flying spaghetti monster and a lot of things we had done locally, um I, I understood 
that it just it just had no traction with Christians. They just didn't get it. And when when Lilith spoke about the Satanic Temple. I knew that if we applied those lessons from what we did with the Flying Spaghetti Monster towards Satanism, like, Satanism has, let's, let's, let's face it, Satanism has brand recognition, you know? You put a oh, pentagram, yeah. it's, it's, you, put a, you put a pentagram with a goat face on it, and you, you, I'm telling you, everyone knows what that is. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows what that is. And so I said, I told Lilith, I've got some great ideas for you. You've got the brand. I've got some ideas. Let's you and I work together. So, um, so anyway, and so back to the, the, the flyer, I mean, you know, you've got that, that pentagram with the goat head and that's just, you know, that gets people's attention. So within hours of both the press release and just before the flyers actually went out, a student had contacted us. Uh, we verified that that, you know, uh, that that person was real and, um, uh, we, uh, we, we, you know, we, we effectively had our invitation and then we got contacted by the uh, president, uh, the senior class president, Abe Bartlett and, you know, talk about a fantastic endorsement. That was, I verified who he was and we were just absolutely thrilled to get those two students, uh, inviting us to come down. Very nice. Let's, uh, go into what happened after the invitation after a quick break. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N.com forward slash atheist nomads. Okay, so you got the invitation. What happened next? Got the invitation, and uh, we let the press know that we have an invitation from a student, and so we were going to come down to the school. Um, and that's when things went crazy with the press. I mean, we got <laughs> uh, we got you know interview after interview after interview, and, and you know the Seattle Times and uh, uh, all the local news stations, and uh, then Danny Westneat of the Seattle Times puts out this great. Uh, editorial or opinion piece about um, about us coming down. You know, Satanists want equal access to the 50 yard line was roughly what the headline said, and things just blew up. I mean, it was kind of like the uh, uh, the clash of cultures. So um, a lot of people want to know what the invocation that we were going to give entailed. So um, uh, and I, I, that was one of those juicy bits that they really wanted to know. So you know, we released some details about the invocation. And uh, largely, it was us coming out as hooded figures onto the to the fifty yard line in a formation. Uh, <laughs> Lilith, our spokesperson and leader, uh, giving an invocation, uh, which largely extolled the virtues of letting go of old superstitions and science and reason and being reasonable. And at the very end, uh, she would bite into what you know the the apple of knowledge, and she would share the apple with another woman who was dressed as Satan. Uh, we called her Lady Lucifer. So the two of them biting into an apple at the same time, about as erotically as they possibly could be. We thought to, you know the idea being that we want to make sure that people never want us back. That that <laughs> it was both creepy and strange, and we never ever want to see this thing again. You know, <laughs> I, I had the gong. I would buy, I would hit the gong solemnly. And, uh, you know, people would, there would be a call and response of hail Satan. And we, we absolutely, the idea was never. So anyway. Don't forget the incense burners. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we had the incense burners, but uh, there weren't going to be any incense in them because we were concerned that maybe the, uh, the school district would not want us to have any lighted anything yeah. lit up on the, oh. on the school. but we had the yeah yeah for the most part they were they were uh, ornamental so i mean they were going to be going out but you know there wouldn't be any incense in them so uh i i we uh as we were practicing it for the for the next day that night that's when we got the call that coach joe was suspended and um uh, there would be no reason for us to do the invocation so uh we decided well well, what now? And we, we all agreed that we wanted to go down to the school anyway. Uh, so we told the press, yeah, we're going down to the school tomorrow anyway, and um, uh, we want to show our support for the students. So um, it, the, the next day, we, uh, you know, we all raced to Bremerton. And I have to thank you, Wesley, because you were our man on the ground. I mean, you were you know, pretty much the laser-guided point to tell us exactly where to be and what was happening there. And so... Oh, yeah. Knocking uh, on the know, news vans as we went. Oh, my gosh. I, you know, like, <laughs> knock, knock, knock. You know, Excuse me, the Satanists are here. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> so, well, just before that, as we are, um, as we're pulling up to the school, there were 
there were four media trucks, you know, with the tall uh, microwave antennas. There was a small phalanx of police there, lots of students. And it's that feeling of when you're in a roller coaster and it's click, 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 going up, up, up. And you don't know what's going to happen once it drops you. You know, that's what that feeling was. We actually had no idea what to expect. And so uh, we arrived at a, a location we figured was far away enough from the school for us to kind of gather up. And honestly, it felt like D-Day. As soon as those doors opened up the car, you know, uh, within minutes, students, some students had recognized us. And I think you saw, Wesley, um, some people yeah. were starting to come off, come out of their houses and look at us. So yeah. I, I, yeah. the whole community knew we were coming. I really do. And uh, thanks to you, Wesley, we, we knew where to go because, you know, we were, we were actually coming in blind. We actually had no idea where to go, where to stand, what was going to happen. Sure. And so thanks to you, you know, you you took us exactly where we needed to be, which was the entrance to the, uh, the school. And uh, I'll never forget, as we're walking along the fence, working our way to the entrance of the school, you hear that first yell. Some students said, oh, my God, the Satanists, they're real. And it was just, <laughs> you see, you know, I, 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 I imagine the entire stadium just starts emptying out because as we're walking along the fence, people starting to gather and gather and yell and, you know, say things to us. And it was just, and Wesley, you know, I mean, it was just getting, the crowd was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, as walking along, Wesley is knocking on the doors of the, uh, the trucks and saying, the Satanists are here. It, it, it probably the most casual <laughs> way possible. Like, oh, yeah, you know, like it's very, very matter of fact, which was was just surreal and uh and you know our, i thought it was just to support the students so as we stood there uh one of the students i, I don't know if i don't think her name has been uh, released publicly or their name has been released publicly but um uh they a lot of them came over to greet us it was really really nice it was to meet the students talk with them tell them what we're about get a lot of hugs it was just it was fantastic but the contrast to that was just say 20 feet away from us on the other side of a fence that's it pretty much uh, guarded by police was the Christian students just jeering and yelling and uh, interjecting. In fact, as we arrived, I remember one guy had come up into our faces and started rebuking us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you. I rebuke you. It was a circus, right? Wouldn't you agree, Wesley? It was an absolute It was totally a circus. But, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned seeing police there, but... Once we got up to the front where the ticket booth was, I didn't see any police. Nothing. No, no uh, police at all. I mean, granted, I know that they were there because I have other people telling me that they were and I saw pictures. But, but when I was out there with you guys, I saw not one police officer. Yeah. Um, just because those kids were raging so much. Yeah. The, the Christian kids. Yeah. I want to go back to the kids saying that, uh, oh, my God, the Satanists are real. Yes. <laughs> They probably would have been growing up in their churches, uh, being told about this satanic menace, and probably thought, heck, that's not real. And then all of a sudden, they show up. Yeah. <laughs> and this is uh, probably the, the most attended game of the year for the Knights, oh, Burlington nice. High Knights. And we, uh, when we were walking up, we actually walked the length of the football field uh, along the fence line. Uh, heading up towards Bremerton High School and the ticket booth. So we had a long walk and a lot of students that were, you know, milling around the, the football field like they do. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, word got spread. People were shouting and it was exciting and kind of kind of fun, kind of scary at the same time. But yeah, yeah people, yeah, people, the word was spread very quickly. Yes. And yeah. the guy that <laughs> shouted in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. Yeah. yeah. Did you see any reaction from him when you didn't recoil and run? Uh, no, no. Uh, he, I believe he was identified in the paper. His first by his first name, it was Michael. And uh, you know, he just he he stood there. He rebuked us. You know, he had a Bible in his hand. He stood in our faces, and nothing happened. Of course, nothing happened. And um, in terms I mean, of one us, of you us, caught on fire, in terms, I put it yeah, out in terms really of quick. Us, yeah, no lightning. We didn't disappear. You know, largely just like every prayer, nothing happened. So. He walked away, and wow! Uh, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if he was shaken by that face wise. <laughs> well, you know, one of the fun parts about it was that uh, the way we were dressed. I mean, we, we didn't come in, you know, looking like uh, like we just came out of a goth club. I and mean, we we largely we were in hooded robes that were very very billowy, and we looked we we did look like Sith lords. I mean, I don't know if you saw uh, the picture of the Seattle Times, but largely hooded figures, and then you have Lilith in front. And when you think about the the optics of that, that uh, instead, like what you would typically associate a Satanist to be, uh, you know, say uh, bikers or you know, you know, 
uh, punks or whatever. Lilith, you know, she, she's like this grand matriarch of darkness. She just comes in like she's, she's a, a motherly figure. And the optics of that, of her being surrounded by hooded, black hooded figures were just, I, 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 could, I can't say enough about how great that looked. And then we had our lady Lucifer, who's, who's absolutely beautiful with the, the curled ram's horns and the, and the makeup that she put all together. It just, the image was about as beautiful as I could have expected. It, it was just awesome. And of course, the optics of, of, of the Christians jeering at us, you know, I mean, shaking the fence, yelling, uh, uh, um, holding up a cross, you know, trying Friends. to bless us, throwing water. I mean, they were just Absolutely. Uh, I'm just grateful we had a fence between us and them because I think we would have just complete, gotten completely overrun by them. The word so, that keeps coming to mind is frenzied. Yes. And there were, there were, uh, I later found out that there were cops that were actually keeping people from going in or out of the, the, the fence yes. so that they couldn't get to us. Yeah. But uh, this, a couple of the kids were actually trying to get out to say hello and Christian kids were throwing bottles of water and rocks saying, you are blessed. Yep. at the kids that were trying to get out. Yep, insulting them and, yeah, really um, uh, making a scene of it. And, and uh, like I yeah. said, of course, we actually had no idea what to expect when we got there. And so, uh, you know, we didn't know if we were, at some point we were going to be surrounded by them. I, you know, I don't know. We wanted to make sure that we didn't distract too much from the game. I mean, this was their homecoming game. We were really there to show our support and, and to show them that we were real uh, and... Um, um, so it's not, yeah, we didn't stay too long. We stayed about, I think, 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, I, 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 do think, I do think that the, the, the students behind the fence were starting to get bolder and bolder, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, they, some of them were trying to climb the fence. Uh, the, the, the insults got more personal, more nasty, uh, you know, like more threatening and more menacing. So, you know, we all agree that, you know, it's probably a good time if we go now because this is actually going to get uglier. So um, as we left, that's probably about maybe... 20 yards uh, heading back uh, towards the cars that's when we finally saw a police presence and I asked one of them point blank can you escort us back to our cars and he flat out refused and so uh, yeah yeah he refused he, he said no nope, uh, you know he just he shook his head said no and returned to um, back to the fence he wouldn't help us out but as we walked further along there were two other cops who were who, who really I think they read this the situation and the two of them escorted the rest of us back to the cars. But uh, at first, yeah, we got a lot of uh, reluctance. You know, I almost felt like uh, um, the attitude with them was, well, you get what you deserve. You come here as Satanists and whatever happens to you is your own fault. So that's how yeah. it felt. That's how it felt. <laughs> um, but the, the, the press that we got the next day um, was, was just, it was incredible. It was, the, the press was, um, uh, you know, I, I've actually jumped too far of the stories is that uh, Coach Joe did not end up praying on the field. But as you know, Wesley, he he prayed by the sidelines, you know, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. At the bottom at the bottom of the uh, bleachers. He, yeah. He couldn't yeah. actually go onto the field at all. Yeah. And I'm sure you've touched on this theme many times in, uh, in the yeah. podcast. But but the idea of religious liberty you know, he could pray pretty much wherever he wants, but as a public official, as a, you know, as part of his official duties, he can't be leading students into prayer. And so, the reason why we were there, you know, uh, was to, you know, illustrate that fact that he wants religious liberty. Well, how about we get religious liberty as well? And that just completely, you know, shook the whole Christian idea of li- religious liberty to its foundation. You see, the, the it bears the uh, the hypocrisy, that lie. It bear, you know, it shows it bare to what it to be is. We want religious liberty only for us, nobody else, you know. And uh, and the way the students reacted to us also, you know, shows that if you're a, a religious minority, then um, you know there's no place for you. And by religion, by the way, I mean we haven't we haven't touched on uh, something else here is that the satanic temple is considered a religion, uh, even though they don't ascribe to any superstitious beliefs. Uh, they feel like. You can be a religion if um, you don't have to necessarily be supernatural, believe in anything supernatural in order to form a religion. And so, so we, we are considered a religion. So therefore, we do have the same religious liberty as uh, Christians or Muslims or, or, or the Jewish belief or what have you. So um, that was pretty incredible. That was a pretty incredible yeah. night. And I, I look forward to doing some other things with the group um, in the very near future. We have some great ideas. We have a lot of the, a lot of the emails that we got were, can you please do this, this for us as well? Can you please there, you know, I, I've got a situation here locally where I, I, I 
am surrounded by a Christian majority and I don't seem to have any voice in this. And so we've got a lot of emails for it. I feel like, like, like the satanic a team, you know, like the, you know, like uh, there's an injustice, <laughs> there's an injustice, come help me, you know? And so that's pretty exciting. And so, and a lot of interest in the group as well. So, uh, tens of I, thousands of rounds of ammo shot. Nobody dies. Nobody's hurt. Yeah. But but still, you get shit accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In fact, that's what the that's what the Seattle Times had said was uh, love him or hate him. Um, the 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 uh, the Satanic Temple of Seattle gets things done. Okay. And I thought that was wow. that was an awesome line. That was really cool. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, so. it, it's interesting that you're getting so much of a response in. Or a request for for help in a a place as irreligious as Seattle. Well, actually, it's the surrounding areas. Uh, we got uh, an email from Oak Harbor. I believe there was one in Tri City. So it was really it's not the the King County Pierce County areas, okay. uh, but it's more like the areas like Bremerton and. Uh, I think what was the one of the cities Oakdale? I can't remember what it was, but but areas outside of of the city areas. Yeah, right, that makes that makes a lot more sense. Yes. Yes. All right. We're going to take another quick break and then uh, let's go into more details about what it's like in the Satanic Temple. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. So I got to mention something that I just got passed to me. Uh, Saudi blogger Raif Badawi, uh, his sentence just got suspended and he might be uh, pardoned. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, that is awesome news. That really is. Yeah. (laughs) All right. um, Going on. Yeah, so we had uh, Lucian Greaves on uh, episode ninety three, so that would have been back in May. Uh, so we we got into a lot of the like the the high level view of the Satanic Temple. What's it like in an actual chapter? Coven. <laughs> We've never called ourselves a coven, but uh, that would be interesting. So so uh, <laughs> the 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 group for, uh, serves several functions. One of them obviously is. Uh, the, the right of religious liberty, you know, does that extend to non-Christians? Uh, another one would be that um, there are some people who, who want a sense of community who are very, very different from their, so, their typical social circle, and they're looking for a place to belong. So, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if I can call this the, the, uh, the island of misfit toys, but there are some very, very different personalities in there, and we all just get along so great. A lot of, uh, a lot of different disciplines, a lot, some really, really smart people who really get it. Um, one of the challenges of the group is that, you know, when you put out that you're a satanic group, is that you don't know what kind of people you're, you'll attract. And so there's always, you know, I'm sure, you know, you know by definition, you've got to be careful. You, you, be careful. You, got, you, got, you never know what kind of person you're going to attract. So, so, you know, when, when new people join, we, there's, a, there's, a, there's a somewhat informal but about to be formal uh, vetting process they have to go through because because we want to make sure that we attract the right kind of person who really gets what we're about. You know, there are some people who, you know, um, uh, want to, you know, perform blood rituals or, you know, who, whatever. And, you know, those aren't the kind of people you want in the group. You know, you really want people who, who get it, who, are, who, um, who understand what we're about, you know. So we, we've, had, we've had to actually reject quite a few people because they really, you know, they're, they're little veins. And for those of you who haven't talked about that, who, who don't know what that is, is it's a very, very um, might is right sort of, sort of group. And, um, uh, and that's just another kind of personality we want, we want to attract. So, so typical, ch- we have had people who want to look into the, like a, a magic aspect uh, to perform actual rituals and that sort of thing. And uh, we, we've kind of... Um, thrown that idea around a little bit, but we still haven't figured out where that fits in, if at all, for our chapter. So, yeah, a lot of pagans, a lot of Wiccans who, you know, uh, who, who want a chance to meet other people who are like them. And uh, so we're still trying to figure out where that fits into the group. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the pictures on, on your website and in the uh, Seattle Times article, you're all dressed kind of goth. Uh, is that common in, in normal uh, meetings that you have? Uh, actually, it, it's a mix. Um, if, you know, if, um, 
uh, what is that show with the Adams family? And there's one normal person. Is it the Adams family? Or there's it one is normal actually person. The family. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I've got that. Yeah, yeah. No, they're called. But that that's me. I'm the guy who is, uh, you know, um, very very ordinary, mundane sort of thing. But we have a, a bunch of people who are like that too. That's maybe not fair to say. But but we do attract all, all sorts of people. So there are people who come uh, who are very goth. Some people who are very punk. Uh, you know, all, all sorts of people. Um, and uh, there's a lot of diversity in the group, which is really, really nice. The, 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 ratio, uh, the ratio of both um, men to women is, 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 is encouraging. The ratio of uh, minorities, it, it's just, it's attracted all sorts of people from all, all over the area. So, um, and basically what we talk about is um, growing, the, growing the group. Um, uh, the different things that we want to bring to the group. We look at future campaigns. And, and what I like about it is that we actually have formed some real friendships in there. There's people who just, for the most part, we all get along so well. We've, uh, so we've done camping trips. Uh, there's, there's always a picnic or a barbecue or a potluck or something going on. So it's surprisingly social. It's actually surprisingly social. And um, uh, it's very, very friendly. It's, it's not what you would expect a, a satanic gathering to be. Uh, by any stretch. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally feel bad because it was actually the monsters, not the not the Adams family. Okay. They had the one normal person on there. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and that's just kidding. I mean, you know, um, we we do dress goth or, or something. We have dressed goth for the uh, Jehovah's Witness action, but I think we're still trying to get a feel for how we want to interpret uh, Satanism. So so we you know I, I get a feeling we'll be breaking out the robes again soon for other street actions and other actions. And it's the one thing you have to say for the costumes is uh, it makes you identifiable. Yes, there was there was no doubt when you went to the the Bremerton game. Yes, yeah, <laughs> it, you know it's one of those things. A, you know, we're trying to figure out. I, I, I think about two nights before we were the idea was that we we're going to go dressed, you know, black clothes and uh, you know, like you know, like uh, like we just came out of a club. But then, you know, through through brainstorm, we realized no, we need to be like hooded figures. That's the visual we want. Is just eerie and creepy and a little bit a little bit uh, definitely unmistakable as to who we were. So. So that actually came together, you know, within within a day or two of the action. So, a lot of people all contributing to make it happen. I mean, it wouldn't have happened if it weren't for a lot of folks who all decided to pitch in at the last minute. Okay, but, so yeah, basically, uh, sounds like it'd be a good group for atheists who like activism and dressing up and trolling. <laughs> Come on, let's call it what it is. Come on, there's some trolling yeah. in there. Oh yeah. And if yeah. I can love it. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I said, it, it, uh, it, it allows us, the brand of Satanist allows us to do things that flying spaghetti monster just, it just wouldn't have the same effect. I mean, if I had gone to, if we had done the, the Bremerton action as the flying spaghetti monster, it just wouldn't have, you know, it wouldn't have had the same impact, you know, it would, it would have been, it would have come out hokey. It would have came out like, yeah, it would have and, came out and like nobody it, would have cared. Right. It, w- it would have been like Monty Python's Flying Circus. Like it just like it was a good, you know, it was played for a laugh, you know. So we need to, you know, like with, with that brand of Satanism, you could do so much more. It's just for the local atheist community for them to just get over that that idea of becoming a Satanist or working with Satanists. I mean, that's a challenge, you know, for the atheist community as well. I mean, I before we had done this, I had um, contacted a lot of people about joining us and, and helping out but they they just like christians can't get past that pentagram and and goat horns so just you know this it, it's uh it's ingrained within most of us is that that's an evil thing and it's an evil religion so that's that's a tough thing for people to get past but if they can get past that if they can intellectualize the fact that no it's not there there, there is no war there is no um uh rituals i uh, know uh, sacrifices you know there's not there's nothing you know no cruelty in it once they realize what that's about it's it's easy for people to understand that we could do something very powerful as a community once they actually realize that all religions are bullshit and yes. this 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 is one way that you know we can use their own their own tools against them yeah yeah and, and actually make a statement that sticks and yeah you know people will remember it and yeah. Like, oh, oh, yeah, you know what? That, that actually well, works. And it's more powerful because it's in their narrative. Yes. Yeah. 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 We, used the, we used the very, very story of their own. 
uh, against them. And in fact, they, you know, like we, in talking about Satanists, as we talk amongst ourselves, I mean, there's some very, very interesting aspects to know is that if it weren't for the Satan of the Bible, you know, the, uh, Adam and Eve would have no knowledge of what good and evil was. And when you think, you know, it, the, Satan takes on a very, very Prometheus aspect when you start looking at him in a different light, when he challenges God against, you know, like, I, I think you're doing things wrong or, you know, this is ty- tyrannical or, you know, even if you look at the kill count in the Bible, I think someone had placed it at several million for God and about 10 for Satan. And, and yeah. most of those 10, he had God's permission. And when you look at the, the even within, the, even within the, the story of the Bible, if you look at it in a different light, Satan actually comes out as a good guy. You know, yeah. and, and and so we embrace the 19th century literature view of him as a bringer of light and a bringer of truth and challenging tyranny, and that you know, like if if you start looking at Satan like that, uh, it's very easy to see where we fit in and why we identify with him so much. Well, and and to with the, the kill count, when you look at it from a historical standpoint, with the development of the character, there was no concept of Satan prior to Babylon, and so the Old Testament, it's only the books written post-exile that there is a Satan. Other, other than that, God is doing both the good and the evil acts. And so God get, takes credit for everything. Yeah. At that time, they preferred that. And then the time came where they wanted to have a bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just the idea, I mean, you know, I, I realize I'm, I'm talking amongst, you know, people who agree with me, but just the idea <laughs> of, of God giving, you know, man free will and then saying, you know, do with it as you will. But you, but I want you to obey me completely, you know, or or love me and and pray for pray, you know, to me. Otherwise, I'm going to send you to hell. And just just mm-hmm. those ideas. I mean, just you know, when, when you look at it that way, I mean, it, it's a it's it's an abusive relationship. Christianity is an abusive relationship with a with a uh, with a God that doesn't exist. So so we like to um, we we like taking on the role of the antagonist. We've actually had people who have figured this out, that have looked at the website, have done a little bit of research, uh, Christians, and and they're still upset with us because they uh, they worry that why would say why would atheists take on you? You don't realize what you're doing. You you are embracing pure evil, and you you have no idea what you're playing with. You know you're playing with fire, and you don't get it. So so even people who know that we're atheists and we don't actually believe in a in a deity of Satan are still terrified with the idea that we would, we would take on his symbols and, and use those uh, to worship and, you know, mm. to, to bring it to the, so people even get, who even know are still terrified by the idea of us bringing yeah. Satanism to their, to their local town. Yeah. That makes sense though. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you're making it sound like these people are this are have like uh, complexes about uh, good luck, bad luck, like don't step on a crack, you know, or, like, why are you tempting fate? I mean, not just from the secure, like a, a being safe standpoint of like, you know, people could attack you, but like, why are you tempting the the powers that be? Yeah. Even though yeah. there aren't any. Well, from the, the Christian standpoint, uh, if you are invoking Satan, he will take you over. Sure. But I'm, I'm saying from the atheist standpoint. like Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Why, well, why would you even care <laughs> yeah well many many christians look at it as uh spiritual warfare that there's this larger global battle between good and evil and so by, by us embracing the devil we are the personification of evil is coming where you know i'm sure that for many people the idea that we're satanists and we're openly satanists really is one of those signs that that armageddon is coming you know so so uh regardless of whether we to, believe or not to be if, fair they've been getting those signs for a couple thousand years. Okay. <laughs> Yes, everything is a sign. I I, I know that <laughs> everything is a sign. Uh, but obviously, we we are definitely one of the signs. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I remember when people thought Obama was the Antichrist. I'm sure they still do. Oh, but yeah. you know, once his once his term or reign, as they would call it, is over, Hillary will be, be the new Antichrist. I actually had a friend who thought Bill Clinton was the Antichrist. And so when I when I pressed him on this, you know, uh, a good decade after he left office, he switched to well. Clinton is one of the antichrists. And I thought, wow, that is a lot of cognitive dissonance working in the background there. That there's not just one antichrist. There are many of them, you know. Well, it's, I mean, once when they're on, in office, yes, they're in the antichrist. But once they get out, then they just become one of the four horsemen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then there's the Adventist perspective that it's the Catholic Church that is the antichrist. Yes. <laughs> Well, I, I've heard like the uh, the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon, you know, and I guess yeah. the idea would be, you know, that it, it spreads across continents or something like that, whatever they had said about it. But, but yeah, I mean, um, more accurately, it's the Pope who is the Antichrist. Okay, sure, yeah. sure, yeah. 
And then when yeah. the Pope dies and a new Pope's elected, then you have a new Antichrist. Great. Yes. We have two, two Antichrists on the planet right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Benedict stopped being the Antichrist when he resigned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And there's, there's just so much going on with um, Christianity right now. It's just, I mean, you know, uh, with, with the Syrian refugees, the, uh, you know, the, the irony of having people who are from the Middle East in need of a place to be and, and, and pretty much every Christian in it, well, not every Christian, but, but a good segment of right wing Christians just, you know, uh, seeing them as, you know, looking the other way and, yeah, yeah, or all terrorists. It's just the the irony of that does you know doesn't escape most of us. You know, um, it's just so. Anyway, anyway, um, uh, yeah. All right, let's yeah. take our our last break. Okay, and uh, then we will uh, finish up the interview. Okay. If you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. To make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon, find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. So, Case. Yes. Why the fuck did you become an atheist? Oh, that's right. We got to insert cursing into this before the uh, yes. the show is over. Yes. yes. And who has so- fuck vagina? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was a fucking Catholic uh, for a good chunk of my life, and um, uh, I I had some friends who were my best friends, and they they had um, become very excited by um, born again Christianity, specifically Assemblies of God. And over time, uh, they, they got me questioning Catholicism, and, and I, I decided to become uh, baptized in their church. And so, uh, in fact, I, ha- I still have the audio tape from that baptism where they, they basically, they, they dunk you in a jacuzzi, uh, you're dressed in white robes, and you, you emerge from the jacuzzi, and, and the, the pastor of the church, he prophesizes over you, explaining, telling you what your future path as a born-again Christian is going to be. Oh, and wow. it's, 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 there's a lot of speaking in tongues, and it's really, you know, it's really a surreal experience. It, and, and that audio tape, sometimes I listen to it, I'm like, wow, that is just bizarre. I can't believe I did that. So anyway, um, and, and being part of this church, um, uh, they had they, they they claimed to speak in tongues, uh, prophesy, faith heal, um, and there was one other, uh, at least one other. And so one of the things I became fascinated with was the speaking in tongues, and I, I, the, the the technical term for it is glossosolia, and who knows if I'm saying it right. But basically, it's that idea of of speaking gibberish, and and they interpret it, and it's very very Arabic sounding gibberish, which is very interesting. And they interpret this as being the tongue of God. This is God's original language, and they're able to speak it. And so, so in, in meeting with one of the pastors there, he he would speak in tongues, and then he would translate the, the speaking. He would say, "All right, this is what I've said," and he, and he would give him some sort of biblical verse or some sort of truism or, or advice from God or that sort of thing. And I remember, I, I mean, I was fascinated by the whole thing. I'd never heard of it before, and never, you know, I just thought, "Wow!" Unlike Catholicism, these miracles are happening every time I go to church. You know, Catholicism has a great, um, you know, the pageantry. They're, yeah, yeah, they're very much like they're very dry, very much like an NPR. They're very, you know, uh, stand, sit, kneel, pray. You know, uh, they, you know, they read a, a liturgy and say a couple things. We all shake hands and then we leave. And so it's very, very structured and and very unemotional. Uh, but assemblies of God and all those or the Pentecostal type churches are very, very passionate with altar calls and, and a lot of emotion and people crying and, and stories of conversion and people being faith healed and, and, you know, falling back. So anyway, um, I was fascinated by the idea of people speaking in tongues and this being the original language of God. So I started recording what the pastor was saying and I don't know why, but at some point I said, you know what? I wonder if if he's really translating. So I, I, one day I played back a segment of him speaking in tongues and I didn't play the translation. And I asked him, so what did you say here? Cause I missed the translation and the translation he, the translation he gave did not match what was on the tape. And that, that, that was the first crack of like, maybe he's making this up, you know? And then when you, you know, the, the faith healings, they had faith healings every Thursday and every, every ailment that you had was a demon. If you had jealousy, it was a demon. Financial problems is a demon. Drug abuse, that's a demon. Everything, every ailment that could affect you was a demon. And so I, I believe people, the demons are actually viruses though. 
if you, yeah. if you get a demon, it's actually a virus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, people who had depression or, or whatever their problems with, they'd throw away their medication, convinced that they were healed. Ooh. Ooh. And, and so, um, you know, if, if you started to be depressed or whatever, you just go back and you have another faith healing. So anyway, uh, I started to really start to question these things. And I remember when they said they had healed someone of AIDS. Now, that is a big deal. That is a big that, – that is – you know, that's a medical marvel. That's a, that's a miracle. That's a true miracle. So I remember asking them, who is this person that was healed of AIDS? And the response I got was very telling. When they said to me, where's your heart when you ask these questions? Where is this coming from? That told me everything I needed to know. That, mm. that they didn't have someone or they didn't want to. I mean, you, you, this is something you should be holding up to everybody. Like, here, here, meet the guy we healed of AIDS. But instead, it was... You know, just believe it, keep, you know, take it on faith and let's talk, you know, let's open up the Bible and talk about something else. So the more questions I asked, the more, the, it, it became clear that the less welcome I was, I was. And it got to the point where my friends were starting to do interventions and trying to uh, prevent me from backsliding. That's probably one of my favorite terms. You know, the idea that, that, you know, being secular is mud or filth and, you know, that you would backslide back into that pit of filth from Christianity. I mean, that, that term alone really, that, that, that always uh, intrigued me. So over time, I just started to question things. And I, and I remember picking up a book from James Randi and reading about uh, applying, uh, about skepticism. And, and a lot of things that I believed at the time uh, really, uh, it really showed me what BS a lot of stuff was. So that started me on that, that journey towards questioning larger things. And so from, from, I became an agnostic for many years. And then I finally decided, you know, I think I'm an atheist, you know, I think I'm an atheist. I, th- I think I can embrace this. I can do it. And uh, I remember when I was at a, hol- a, a, a New Year's Eve party, and they had this big circle. Everybody was in a circle, and, and they'd go around to everybody, and everybody would say what religion they were. And I couldn't wait. I had just become an atheist actually a few <laughs> days before. I couldn't wait to tell people. So one guy was a Buddhist, another guy was a Christian. Each one gave a little story or something like that. And then it came to me, and I said, well, I'm an atheist, and here's, here's why. And I'm not kidding you when I said I got two sentences out before they moved on to the next person. They just, <laughs> they just didn't want to hear what, it, what an atheist believed. They just didn't want to hear it. And I'm like, I guess this is the way it's going to be is that, you know, people, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dirty word, you know. And, and, and thankfully, that's changed. Thankfully, it's changed. But at the time, it was, it was very telling as to where society was in terms of accepting people who did believe, you know. Um, oh, yeah. 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 That, that really told me a lot. Anyway, over time, I became uh, involved in the local secular community, and uh, it's, been, it's been fantastic. I've, I've met and worked with so, just some wonderful people, especially in the Seattle area, and um, uh, you know, I've had a lot of great adventures. As a skeptic, I've, uh, I've met a lot of really interesting people, um, 9-11 truthers. I've met people who thought they were vampires. We, mm-hmm. I, met a guy, I met a guy who um, claimed he could move objects with his mind, so I met with him, and he couldn't move anything with his mind. He'd been practicing for 10 years and it, it, it was a whole lot of nothing. So uh, he had a pine needle on the tip of his finger and he, he said he could move it and absolutely nothing happens. And, if, and he blamed <laughs> that it on negative fright. What's that? Yeah, stage yeah. Fright. All those non believers. Well, the, the excuse was actually fascinating. He had said that, that, anyone, that anyone could get into his mind, anyone in the world, and prevent his powers from working. And I thought that was an incredible excuse. That was an incredible. Whoa. Yeah. Pretty yeah. fucking lame. Yes. So no abil- ability to filter out any noise at all. None at all. So anytime he failed, he could always just blame it on something else. And and, and you know, being a skeptic, I uh, uh, I'm I'm a part of the local skeptic community. I've, I, the idea there is that you want to meet with people for whom you disagree, and they can you know like I, I want to know why you think that. I want to know why you think you're you're you. Um, can drain people's energy with your mind or why do you think 9-11 is an inside job or um, uh, <laughs> why do you believe that faith healing is real and just try to get to and, and see if they can demonstrate any evidence for it and you know I, you know where I am today is that none of it has held up none of it and so I want to hear more about the vampire oh okay <laughs> uh, sure sure and uh, it was uh, in, I believe it was in September of 2008 uh, there was a vampire co- uh, convention in Redmond and basically uh, I was invited by there, there are two different flavors of vampires by the way one is the sanguines and the other one is the psychics the sanguines are the ones who actually drink blood uh, the psychics are the ones who can look at someone and drain their energy from a distance I mean these are their claims 
And so I was invited by the Sanguines because they wanted me to do a presentation for them to knock the psychics down. It was, it was kind of like bringing in a hired gun, like, oh, there's a skeptic in town. Let's, <laughs> let's invite him to do a presentation for us so, that, so the psychics know what idiots they are. So – <laughs> uh, yeah, so, the, so they were at a wow. convention center. Yeah, yeah, they were at a convention center. Uh, not a, it, w- it was a, a meeting place uh, up in Redmond. I can't remember what it was. Uh, it's, it's just off Redmond Town Square. And um, uh, I, I met some real interesting characters there. And they were all very, very nervous about having me around. And so as a skeptic, if you, you understand that if you want to change someone's mind, you cannot attack them. Because just like, just like sports – religion and politics. These are all areas where most people are a little bit illogical. And if you attack them directly, the cognitive distance kicks in and they don't change their minds. So you try to establish a way of finding commonality with them. And then through that commonality, you explain why you think a little differently. So with psychics, uh, with, with addressing the psychics in that, uh, in that group, um, I explained to them uh, how you can test to see if you're psychic. You know, like you, 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 you set up the conditions for here's a legitimate and fair test. So I know that I'm not going to change your mind, but here's, please understand that this is why I think the way I do. Because what, what, like I said, the sanguines really wanted me to knock them down. And let me tell you a little bit about the sanguines. I, I think that's interesting too, is basically they have a person for whom they have a relationship with and that person donates blood and the sanguines drink that blood. Like they test them for HIV and other blood illnesses and they have a relationship with them that they, they drink their blood. Yeah, but it's not directly it's you know it's it's put into a vial and they, they drink from that vial really interesting characters wow. I know. yeah they also shows a lot of a lot of their faith in their vampire abilities to not yes. be able to filter out hiv and other diseases yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and, and the, uh, the convention was called twilight and uh, the oh, ironic no. No, no, hear me out, hear me out. <laughs> ironically, ironically, this was just before the movies had come out, right? And I suspect that, that, that you know, maybe the organizer had read the Twilight book and absolutely loved it. So they called it the Twilight Convention. And then those, those terrible movies just get released. <laughs> and, and suddenly, they, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of eggs on the face like, oh, we can never do this again. In fact, they, that was actually the last convention they had done. Uh, as vampires, you know, but I met, I met interesting people. I, know, I met a woman whose father did um, homeopathy. And when we talked about the placebo effect, she said, yeah, we know it's the placebo effect, but we bring it about. Therefore, we're healing people. And I, and I, I said, but don't you understand that that's dishonest? And it just didn't, it didn't occur to her that that was dishonest at all. Anyway, really interesting wow. characters. Yeah, really interesting characters. Yeah. The, the truthers were the toughest one. You guys don't mind me rambling a little bit, do you? Oh, no, 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 no. have at it. This is oh, funny. Cool. Okay. The truthers were fascinating. Um, basically, I, I hadn't known too much about 9-11 Truth, so I invited them to present for our group. And um, uh, it, it looked like their sci- they actually brought a quite amount of people with them, all, all truthers, all believers. And they, they gave a presentation and it just didn't, the science just didn't hold up. Um, but we want to be fair. We want to give them a chance. And um, they really they they got pretty upset over us us challenging them on just some basic physics. But but actually the interesting story is there is a a nine eleven truth group that's very very strongly associated with uh, the local Ron Paul libertarian uh, scene here in Seattle. And I, I was invited to check out one of their meetups. And in the meetup they they had one of the truthers give a presentation. And, you know, it, nothing held up. So I said, you know, I'd like to give a presentation as well. Would you invite me to come and give a counter-presentation counter to this? And so uh, I put together something for them. And uh, I did that thing where I said, you know, I tried to bridge the gap between them. And I talked about how we all have cognitive dissonance. I said, even I have bias. You're not alone. I'm not picking on you. I'm the same way. But let me tell you what my research was all about. And I felt like in, in a room full of truthers, I felt like a piece of bacon surrounded by pit bulls. I mean, they did not like me at all, <laughs> interjecting, yelling at me. And, you know, I, I, you know you've got to be able to hold the room down. So you can hold, you'll have to hold your questions to the very end of my presentation. And so with these questions, I, you know, like I gave the presentation and I did it in such a way like if, if you want to change a conspiracy theorist's mind about a conspiracy, they, you know, it, it uses a different part of a brain to become a conspiracy theorist. So you've got to use a conspiracy to get them out. You, 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 you leverage. <laughs> 
which is almost like a, a fulcrum and a lever. They, you can pop them out by using a different conspiracy theory. So the one, the one that I did was, at the time, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth was a big deal. I, I don't know what their influence is now. I, I'm sure it's pretty faded. So most people pulled from that playbook. They used their brochures, their talking points, their, their website. You know, they got all these talking points. And I, I used conspiracy. It's like, why? I played the video that they love to use on their website, and it shows the towers coming down. And, and it talks about how these are demolitions for sure. And I used that very, very same clip, except my clip did not have the sound taken out. And I demonstrated to them, like, you could not – you it, it, in demolitions, you have to have the explosion. And in the explosion, there are physics. And in those physics, there is sound. It is indisputable. It will happen every time. So my conspiracy theory to them was, why did they take the sound out? <laughs> why would they take the sound out of this video? Why does, why does the leader of this organization uh, t- uh, uh, have a salary that, it, that he, does not, he doesn't reveal to anybody? Why are you paying for these materials? Well, like, wh- why does 11,000 architect- architects and engineers, why don't they have any more evidence other than what they've had for almost five years now? And, and one of the most damning things was uh, – Jesse Ventura's show for a while, he had uh, Jesse Ventura's conspiracy theory. And in that, he tested one of the theories for 9-11 Truth, and he used what was a very, uh, a favorite demolitions expert. His name was, um, oh boy, we'll call it Van Damme, but it, it escapes me right now. And, uh, but anyway, he used a, a professor out of Utah. So anyway, um, they, they show the results of his test. But before mm. they can give the conclusion of the test, they cut it off. They cut to Jesse Ventura and says, well, that's pretty damning. Before the, the test was finished, they, Jesse Ventura said, well, those results are pretty conclusive. So I wrote to this, <laughs> this professor in Utah. I got his email address. I wrote to him, and I asked him about the segment. And he responded, they misrepresented my views to be the exact opposite of what I presented. So I showed the people in the truthers – uh, demonstration. I showed them that email. Here's the email I got from them that showed that Jesse Ventura misrepresented the results. I said, why do you think they would do that? And you could just see also all the cognitive dissonance just pop across the room like, oh my gosh, they're lying to us. And, and, and to use a conspiracy theory, to get someone out of a conspiracy theory, just it absolutely worked completely. You know, it absolutely mm-hmm. You know, I had some people who, I mean, they didn't all believe in it, but, but by the end, when you get a round of applause, you know that you've reached some people, you know? Yeah. So, hey. so that, that was a lot of fun. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. And that's a really good approach to go with because any organized conspiracy theory obviously has a conspiracy involved. Yeah. So, you, so you use the, 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 the same method, you use that same part of the brain to get them out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so that, that was one of my favorites. So that was one of my favorites. But, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever met uh, – actually, I, I shouldn't go too much into it, but uh, LaRouche's, you know, the people who, who say that Obama Linda is Hitler. Oh. And, yeah, Linda LaRouche, yeah. Yeah, very, very, very strange. They, uh, from what I hear, that they are somewhat of a cult in themselves, that they're very, very sequestered from people, that they only read literature that, uh, that agrees with their, their worldview. Um, in fact, one of the – one of the things you know you're in a cult is what happens when you try to leave? What happens when you try to get out of a cult? How do people respond to you? Can you still be part of the same social circle or are you out? And I remember when we had a guy present for uh, the LaRouche several years ago and at some point he started to question things and he wrote to me and he said to me um, that they kicked him out, that he was, he was kicked out and he was no longer welcome to be as part of the group. And that's, how, that's one of those indicators of being in a cult is – you know, uh, once you're out, you can't, you can't talk to anybody in the group. And I like to think that, you know, Wesley, let's suppose I became yeah. a theist. I, you know, let's suppose I, I said, you know what, I actually, I've seen the light. I had a near-death experience. I sure. like to think that you would not reject me, that you'd say, you know what, I, you know, I, I feel bad for Casey, believes right now, you know, whatever. But you would not say to me, I never want to talk to you again, you know. I would definitely not and, outright reject right, you. Right, right. And that's the difference between us and many, many groups is that, you know, like you, we can challenge each other's worldview, and we don't necessarily say, you know, I never want to talk to you again. I'm going to defriend you. You, you betrayed us. You're done. You know, uh, yeah, definitely. and that, and that's why, that's why we're not a cult. You know, that's one of the reasons why we're not a cult is that, you know, we're open to different points of view. You know, unlike say Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and we could talk long form about Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, you know, uh, um, uh, they. Uh, they, they, they take on the look of being a very, very milk toast religion, but they really are very, very dangerous in, in how they control their members. They really are. And most people don't realize that you have to give your time up to, uh, to pioneering or to, 
do, donating your time. To, basically, Jehovah's Witnesses is a, is a book publishing organization. They, they, they exist to give out books and to, to, to give books to people or, you know, to sell them. And um, when it's you kind of like, like the Mormons it, well, uh, where you have you are forced to donate your time and yeah. your, your tithe, your money. Yeah. So you have to stand out there, pioneer either going door to door or, or standing, you know, at a uh, at a metro tunnel entrance and try to um, push the word of Jehovah onto people. That mm-hmm. that is that's what you spend a lot of your time doing. You have to dedicate anywhere from 20 to 30 hours per month of your free time to to witnessing to people. Um, and so uh, the, that that tells me a lot about that this is this. When you look at a lot of their doctrines, they really are about Jehovah and nothing else. If a, if a disaster happens in the world, we only help Jehovah's Witnesses. Otherwise, you know, we just turn a blind eye, a blind eye to it. You know, I, I don't want to get too much off the rails with Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, but, and yeah. for for <laughs> listeners who want to get more detail on Jehovah's Witnesses, that was covered in episode sixty five with Chase. Oh yeah, uh, who's a yeah. former uh, Jehovah's Witness himself. Yes, may I tell you a short story about Chase? By yeah. Means. Okay, so I I never met Chase before, and uh, he and I had met for a uh, to put together an event for um, one of the local secular groups, and over time, as he's talking, uh, I could tell that that there was something different about him. And I remember at the very end of all the discussion, as we're all talking, I said to him, "Hey, Chase, do you mind if I ask you a personal question in front of everybody else?" And you know, the the quizzical look I got from him, like, "Yeah, okay, sure." And I said to him, "Are you strong in the truth, brother?" And, <laughs> And that is a, that is a, that is a that's a key phrase for Jehovah's Witnesses. That means, are you still are you a strong Jehovah's Witness? And the look that he gave me was, he said, "Are you a former Jehovah's Witness?" I said, "No, I'm not." But you speak like one. You present yourself like one. You don't have a you don't have any facial hair, and your word choice is very 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 much like Jehovah's Witnesses. And he was like, "God." Damn it! I still have the smell of Jehovah's Witnesses on me. You know, <laughs> yeah. Chase is one of the sweetest kids I've ever met, oh, and, he, and he's a completely—he's he's just right out of out of an Abercrombie ad. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> and, and, and you know, he's so modest and so good and such a great guy. Yeah, he's just—he's a—I he, I like Chase. He's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. So that's my Chase story for you. Yeah. If, if I was gay, I would be chasing after Chase. <laughs> <laughs> High five, Wes. <laughs> it's kind of dreamy. Just yeah. letting all you girls out there know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, on that note, we're running out of time. Yes. <laughs> uh, Case, what do you have that you want to plug? Oh, oh, no, no. That I, I. Well, I mean, there's there's the Satanic Temple of Seattle, uh, an organization that I am just just completely uh, in love with. I, I really do enjoy working with them. So, uh, the Satanic Temple of Seattle, their next public event is going to be at the Fremont Library. That is, I believe, it's at one or three o'clock, um, and that's a uh, Sunday, December sixth. If I if I got my dates right. Um, and I, that's our first public meeting, and I definitely encourage people to come out, check us out, see what we're all about. And I, I think that uh, um, you'll find a lot of things that you really enjoy about the group. Got all a right. website and Twitter for them? Uh, the Satanic Temple Seattle is the website for it. Uh, that's dot com. Exactly, yeah, dot com. Okay. And I also have links for uh, Facebook and Meetup in the uh, show notes. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, make, sure, make sure people see that. That'd be great. Am I actually a Satanist now? Are you actually a Satanist now? Yeah. I, I mean, I consider you part of the group, you know. All right. Uh, it, uh, you know, we'd it, love to have is, you come down to a public event, but I mean. Is it, there a ritual or anything? Uh, no, no ritual. Although we've right. thought about it. I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but um, for the Detroit chapter of the Satanic Temple, when they, they, really, when they had a party to uh, show the Baphomet statue, one, yeah. thing, one of the things they had people do is sign a disclaimer that said that uh, if – but by participating in this event, you agree that you're giving over your soul, your soul to Satan. And, uh, and it, no matter what name you signed here, you are giving your soul over. And they did that as a great filter for people who were trying to infiltrate the, the whole event, which I thought was fantastic. So, so, Wesley, just to check, maybe we'll have you sign one of those. But you know, sure, I, think sure. you, I think your bona fides speak for themselves. But, you know, you know I consider you one of us. Yeah, so you're a Satanist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've done so much. So, yeah. Oh, boy. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Case, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a thank pleasure. You. Oh, same here. Same here. Thank you both. It's been a fucking blast. Absolutely, you motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you 
for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.